I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard Russell Library at the University of Georgia and Young Harris College. Our guest is Don Johnson, former Georgia state senator and a congressman from Georgia's 10th district. Don, we're delighted to have you as our guest. Thank you, Bob. Good to see you again. Born in Atlanta, spent most of your life in Royston. That's right. Yeah, my, uh, my father was in Emory Law School when I was born, and uh, I was born in 1948. And um, he was just starting Emory Law School, so the first three years uh, I lived there in various spots around Emory. And, um, it, but he and I, uh, or he, always wanted to move back to Royston. And I'll never forget him coming when I was a little boy, about three years old, and we'd talk about what we're going to do when we move back to Royston. And, and I'd say stuff like go fishing, you know, and go to Slickery Rock. That was his favorite spot in, um, near where we lived. And, but uh, moved back to Royston and, and grew up there. Um, my uh, father was the district attorney. First he was solicitor. They called it Solicitor General and they changed the name of it um, in the mid-60s, I think. <clears throat> my grandfather, his father, had been practicing law there since 1911. And he also was in politics. He was in the state house, state senator. And then under Eugene Talmadge, he was um, assistant attorney general. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess I've got politics a little bit in my genes from, from them. And in fact, my great-grandfather, who was uh, named Judge Jerome Bates, uh, he wasn't a judge, but he was a lawyer. But he had the name Judge J Jerome Bates, and um, he was in the state house in the 1880s, and then again in about 1920. Mm -hmm. And um, he lived up there kind of near where you do, except uh, a little bit further to the northwest, a place called Spring Place. And, um, but he practiced law up there and was a state legislator, and um, my grandmother, she, he, he was on my grandmother's side. Um, and she used to tell a story about they went out into Oklahoma in a covered wagon uh, with him, and he, um, they got a, a, a bunch of Indians came up on them one time, and he told them to get under the wagon. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it was, you know, a very interesting story uh, about that. But I never, of course, knew him because he died in the 30s, but I knew a lot about him. and. Um, from her, she was um, part Indian, and so am I, of course. <laughs> um, and it came through the Bates uh, family. Tell us about your father. He was a prosecutor at the uh, Lemuel Penn murder trial. That's right. That was in 1964, right after the uh, Civil Rights Act had been enacted, and um, he, his his uh, district included Madison County and Elbert County. Uh, he had a five-county region, but there was a, a group of Ku Klux Klansmen that hung out over here in Athens. And um, one night uh, in July of 1964, Lemuel Penn and two other uh, officers in the reserves of the Army were driving back from uh, Fort Benning, and, um, and that was before I-85 was built, and they were taking the back roads. And they drove through Athens, and uh, this a, a group of Klansmen followed them out of town, and um, all the way up to on Highway 172 as they were crossing the Broad River. Bill Ship wrote a book about murder at Broad River Bridge, and it's about that story. And uh, so as they crossed in uh, to that county, it entered my dad's um, district, and so he prosecuted that case. Now, as I said, my father and grandfather were lawyers, and I didn't know very much about law except my dad would come home complaining about a jury verdict he might have lost, and, um, and I didn't think I ever wanted to be a lawyer because of that, because um, he complained so much about, you know, different things that were happened in his practice. But, um, <clears throat> but he took us all to that trial because it was a big event. Uh, it, it was covered from you know, the Washington Post and the Newsweek and, uh, you know, L.A. Times, all of the papers in America came to converge on Danielsville, Georgia, 
where they had the trial. And my dad uh, prosecuted it, and, and that's when I got interested in the law. Uh, also uh, became a big admirer of his uh, for his courage because he did a really outstanding job. Uh, he, and a, um, he, he brought in another prosecutor to help him with it because back then they didn't have a system DAs and you know he handled the whole thing. Um, but a, a fellow by the name of Wayne, uh, I can't think of his first name now, but came from Gainesville. Jeff Wayne. Jeff Wayne, that's right. And they tried it together. And, um, and then at the end, my dad gave uh, a tr terrific uh, closing argument. And um, among the things that he said was, have the courage to do what's right, talking to the jury. And, um, you know, the, uh, the state of Georgia is on trial here. Do will we convict when there's a crime committed in our county? And um, unfortunately, they uh, didn't convict. They acquitted them. Uh, they had um, some confessions by one of them that uh, he later repudiated the, the confession, but they still entered it into, um, into the record. And um, I've got an editorial by the Washington Post on, in my office now that was praising my father and, you know, for the prosecution and quoted from his uh, closing argument. So I know that he did a good job. And uh, from that time forward, I became interested in becoming a lawyer. Um, but that had a big effect on me in a lot of ways, politically, uh, as well as, you know, having a, a conscience about what was going on in the world at that time. Um, the next big event that happened in my life uh, that had an impact on, on my uh, political philosophy and uh, outlook on, on life was uh, 1968. Um, you know, that was the year that uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, then Robert Kennedy was assassinated. I was a fraternity boy over here at the university and, you know, was interested primarily in, in drinking beer and chasing girls. And, um, and just as I had been in high school, I was interested in high school football and other things, and this kind of woke me up. Uh, well, 1968 was a big year, not only because of those two assassinations, but also because of the riots that took place at the Democratic Convention. And it was the year of the um, President Johnson um, deciding not to run after the Tet Offensive which we actually won, but, um, but the results on television didn't look that way. And, um, you know, it, it really shook my conscience as to what was going on in the world. Um, but, you know, over the years, I always became, uh, you know, a strong Democrat. And part of it was that, even though that was a very difficult time for the Democratic Party. Um, and I'm ne I've never changed. Um, uh, you know, supported George McGovern for, for uh, uh, president. I'll never forget going, walking around. I was a first year law student then and um, going to a football game in the stadium here with a McGovern button on, <laughs> you know, just out of defiance because there are a lot of people who, most people didn't, you know, want to reelect Richard Nixon. But when I graduated from law school, um, I had an Air Force commitment. I was an ROTC. Um, student at the university and um, had gotten an educational delay. I was going to be a pilot, and, um, but my eyes went bad, uh, at least they weren't 2020 when I left law school, so they, I got in the <coughs> JAG program. But before I did, I got Phil Landrum, um, who was congressman from the 9th District at that time, to uh, give me a job to uh, work for him until uh, I, you know, the Air Force called me in. Mm -hmm. And um, he was on the Ways and Means Committee, as you might remember. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the third ranking member. Um, I always forget when I went to Congress later, um, if he had uh, lived to the time I went to Congress, he still wouldn't have been chairman because Dan, he was right behind Dan Rostenkowski. And I used to sit behind him and Rostenkowski and listen to Rostenkowski tell these crazy stories, you know, and sometimes he'd, he'd forget to turn his mic off and say something kind of raunchy. And, uh, and, uh, it was, but it was a very interesting time for me because I was straight out of law school 
and, um, and they took up the trade bill um, of 1974. It was actually 73. <clears throat> it was called the Trade Act of, I mean, the Trade Reform Act of 73 when I was working on it, because I moved from his staff to the Ways and Means Committee staff. It was a real interesting time because that was when Watergate was going on. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the, the Ways and Means Committee, the chairman was Wilbur Mills, and a uh, very interesting character. He later got in trouble with Fanny Fox, but when, when I was there, I, I would watch him closely because he was a very smart man. He Harvard Law School, you know, he, re, he wrote the 1954 tax code. Um, but we were taking up this major trade reform bill. And I have been studying under uh, Dean Rusk here at the law school, and I you know, was very interested in international law. That's what I wanted to do. That's what, I was driving on campus uh, the day I heard on the radio that Rusk was coming here. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, I'm not sure I can get in any other law school. I may not be able to get in this one, but I want to come here because of, of Rusk. Even though I was at that time opposed to the Vietnam War, because um, I thought it was uh, more of a uh, uh, internal, you know, revolution as opposed to, um, you know, Chinese communist-inspired activity that was going to create a domino effect throughout the rest of the world. Um, but I had great respect for Rusk, and when I was in law school, he was uh, became a great mentor of mine. Um, I consider him to be the most influential man in my life besides my father, um, even though he didn't always know it, you know, but I, I just by watching him, and, uh, and he helped me with a number of things, and, and I was close to him the rest of his life. In fact, the last time I saw him was when I was in Congress and had just lost my election. I wanted to say this about Rusk. Um, this was, we were at the Georgia-Georgia Tech game, and I had been invited by Chuck Knapp, who was president of the college then, or the university then, and to, to sit in the president's box. And um, Rusk was sitting in the back smoking a lark, uh, you know, even though they had prohibited smoking in the stadium at that point, especially in the president's box, but he was allowed to do it because he you know, was so old and respected. And uh, I looked over to him, he, he looked at me and he said, better luck next time. <laughs> and, you know, he, he had contributed to my campaign. I didn't even want to cash the checks because I thought so much of him and I wanted to save it, but, but I spent it anyway. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I, I just mentioned that as a, a story about Rusk. But when I was at, um, on the Ways and Means Committee staff, they only had 25 members of the committee. It's a lot bigger now. Had no subcommittees. And uh, they only had one staff member working on trade at that time. Now they got Republican staff, Democratic staff, and professional staff, and it's, you know, just doing trade work. But at that time, I was an economist that I, I worked for uh, when Landrum got me the job uh, working for, for the Committee on Trade because I was interested in international law. And um, I'll never forget one day, this guy was a very quiet guy, he was, a commie, I mean, commie, he was an economist, and um, you know, just thought like an economist. And I never even knew what his political positions were because we were on the professional staff. You know, it was, of course, they're all hired by uh, Wilbur Mills was in charge of everything. But he never expressed much political opinion. But one day I was over at the Capitol and I saw Spiro Agnew come, up, come out of the door. And of course, he was, you know, vice president at the time and it was nothing. I mean, he was a very controversial figure because of the speeches he gave and uh, everything. But he was walking out of the door, and I saw he had kind of a grim look on his face, and he got in this limousine and drove off. And I, I turned to, the, to a guy that was there at the door and, and said, was that Agnew? And he said, yeah, it was. He just turned in his resignation to Carl Albert, the speaker at the time. And I said, my God. D and, you know, I had no idea what, why he turned in his resignation. <clears throat> but I walked back across the street to the Longworth building where the uh, Ways and Means Committee was. And, uh, and I went up to Harry Lamar, who was the uh, staff person I was telling you about, the economist, and I said, Harry, you won't believe what just happened. Spiro Agnew just resigned. And, I, and he said, he looked at me and he stood up and said, hot damn, one down and one to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just totally took me by surprise because this guy, you know, he'd never said anything about Nixon or anything else. 
But that whole time I was up there, and I got I went over and spoke to uh, Herman Talmadge because he, you know, my grandfather was a big Gene Talmadge man, and my father was, you know, very loyal to to the Talmadges and. Um, and I always saw a lot of Herman. I mean, he had some flaws like we all do, but um, but he was uh, real sharp on that on that Watergate committee. And so I, I took the opportunity to go over and speak with him, and he was very kind to me. And as I walked in the door, I saw the political poster on the wall. You, you may have seen it. It said, you know, Gene Talmadge, dirt farmer. Of course, he was a lawyer and, you know, very astute student of... Um, uh, you know, different things, but uh, he wanted to be known as a dirt farmer. But also, I got to uh, sit in on some of the Watergate hearings that went on. I saw Elderman and, and Hall, Haldeman give their uh, testimony. And um, so it was a very interesting time uh, to be there. But then I went in the Air Force uh, about eight months later. And after we got the bill passed, I mean, I say we, I, I, the only thing I did was, you know, help this economist. Um, and, um, and then I wrote uh, Landrum's speech on that, that, um, that he gave on the floor on the trade bill. But um, so I spent four years in the Air Force. Um, my first year was in California at Vandenberg Air Force Base, a missile base out there. And most people would have liked to have stayed there for the full four years, but um, I was too antsy. My first son was born there, uh, Cleet, named after my father. And um, I volunteered along with the uh, advice and consent of my spouse, <coughs> Suzanne. Uh, we, and we went to Turkey. We volunteered to go to Turkey for a two-year assignment. And a really interesting time to, to be there. And, right after the Turks had invaded Cyprus and um, the U.S. Congress had imposed an embargo on Turkey. And um, the, um, one of my jobs as a, as a judge advocate was to visit uh, Americans who had been locked up in, in Turkish jails. And I remember going down there to um, the big jail at the, at the city where, where we lived and um, meeting the warden. And he, I don't think he spoke any English except for one word. He said to me, embargo, choke for nah. That means, you know, very bad in, in Turkish. And, um, <clears throat> but I, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed that time because we were down on the Mediterranean. It's uh, right across the border from Syria. Uh, my wife and I drove down to Beirut uh, once and then, you know, really all over the place. We traveled to Russia and Egypt and you know a, a lot of interesting places from that that center, and it it caused me to become more and more interested in international affairs and international politics. Um, so when I graduated, I mean I'm sorry, when I finished my tour of duty in uh, in Turkey, I thought it was time for me to get out. I had served three of my four-year commitment and I thought well they don't want to pay for me to go to another base and then get out a year later but they didn't go for it they want me to stay <laughs> so uh, I went we went to Denver Colorado at Lowry Air Force Base which is not there anymore but um, it was where we, there was a prison and so I tried uh, about 25 courts martials um, during the time I was there uh, there weren't many courts martials at Vandenberg or in Turkey. I had a few. Where I represented both the defen defense and I was mainly a prosecutor, but um, we had so few people we had to cover both bases. <laughs> so uh, that was my most of my criminal trial experience. I never really uh, tried any criminal cases after that. But um, I decided I wanted to go back to school and um, study international law more. So I got accepted in the London School of Economics, um, which the full name is London School of Economics and Political Science, and they have a law faculty there. It's one highly respected, and I studied international economic law, which was mainly international trade law, European law, and some comparative uh, law courses, um, because I got interested in international trade while working on the Ways and Means Committee. So that was kind of my introduction to international trade, which played a big role later in my life. 
Um, but after I graduated from the uh, LSE, um, I was wanting to go back to Washington. But um, I, and and I had a friend that was in Chicago. I had I had a, a we were debating. My wife got this really good job teaching at the American School in London, and uh, they paid American wages, which back then was a lot higher than British uh, wages. And we were enjoying living in London, so I, I thought, well, I might like to stay here a little bit longer. And I had a friend that worked for Continental Bank in Chicago. He was a uh, fraternity brother of mine here at, at Georgia, and we were, you know, really close friends. And, uh, and he said, well, you should come. Uh, I asked him if, if Continental Bank, which is the big seventh largest bank in the country at the time, um, and had a big branch in London. And I was going to see if they hired lawyers in, in London. And um, he said he, he found out that they didn't. But he, he said, and I was coming back to Washington to do some interviews. And he talked me into coming to Chicago to interview there. And when I went to Washington, things had changed quite a bit. Number one, Jimmy Carter was president. This was in 1978. And there were too many Georgians in, in Washington. It was hard to get a job as a Georgian at that time uh, if you didn't know the right people, and I really didn't. So um, I decided to go to Chicago and interviewed there. And they offered me a job and said they'd pay for me to, you know, move my furniture back from London and everything else. And it was a, you know, pretty, real interesting job. And I was interested in international uh, finance. And uh, so that's what I did for the next two years in Chicago. I did international finance at this bank in Chicago. Um, in Chicago, I found to be a great town. It was awfully cold in the wintertime and awfully hot in the summertime. But it's a great city, and, and my wife and I and young son enjoyed living there, but decided that it was time to move back to Georgia um, in 1980. So I stayed there for two years, and um, I interviewed with a number of firms in Atlanta um, and had two offers, and uh, one of them was with Powell Goldstein, Frazier & Murphy, which um, has been absorbed now by another firm, but it's uh, still got a lot of good people there. And uh, it turned out my uh, grandfather was a close friend of Buck Murphy. You, you remember who that is. He was a good Talmadge man, and um, and Buck Murphy was still alive. He was um, he was retired, and he died not too long after I got there, but um, but he was still there. And my grandfather, I had some correspondence between him and Buck Murphy when uh, my grandfather would associate Powell Goldstein to handle a, firm, a case, you know, that was in Atlanta and he didn't want to go there and so forth. But um, so I stayed there for two years and, and um, I decided that um, I didn't like being an associate in a big firm. Um, and they weren't doing the kind of international law that I was interested in. They were, you know, representing German and Japanese investors in, you know, in Georgia. So it was really just Georgia law with a foreign client. Uh, that's what they called international law back in, uh, in the 80s, in Atlanta anyway. And um, so I got to thinking that, you know, I might like to move back to my hometown. My father and grandfather had practiced law there since 1911. This was 1982, and um, against my father's best advice, I, I moved back there. You know, a lot of fathers like for you to move back home. Well, he thought I was crazy, uh, giving up a good job in Atlanta, um, you know, with a big firm, and coming back and struggling as a young lawyer, because he, he was already retired. Um, but what I did was I moved back there and used his name and we firm, formed the uh, partnership of Johnson & Johnson, just like he did when he moved back after you know, graduating from Emory in 1952. Um, and um, so I started practicing and, and just basically had to create the practice. He was still doing a little bit of real estate work, but, uh, but really not much else. And he, he died three years after I got back there. Um, which was kind of all a sudden uh, thing because he was only 69 and a little bit too young to, to die, but unfortunately that's what happened. But one of the reasons I moved back was because I was interested in politics. 
and I had, a, you know, some friends who were in politics. Pierre Howard was uh, my really close friend from all the way back to the University of Georgia. And, um, and others, I had uh, Joe Frank Harris was, um, was governor, and um, he had a top aide, Rusty Sewell. Rusty and I were in law school together, but he also was my cousin. Um, and so I started talking with them after my father died. He, I had some people come want me to run for state representative, and uh, you know my dad was still alive, and he said, "Don't do that." You know, that's, uh, he he'd been through it, you know, because he he had been he ran for state representative. He had been mayor of Royston. My grandfather had been mayor of Royston. I, I didn't get to be mayor of Royston because I I moved out of town uh, in 1985, and. Um, I was city attorney and city judge, and uh, was it really enjoyed my law practice there. But I, I didn't really do anything in politics until 1987. Um, I was real interested in the state senate, and um, and Parks Brown, uh, who got very ill in the um, first session of, of 1987, uh, died um, in about April or May of that year. And um, Pierre Howard called me and said, look, if you would like to run for the state senate, I've got a fellow who helped me in my last campaign, he'll, he'll help you. And, uh, and I'd like to give you all the help I can get. And then uh, I talked to Rusty and several others. And, and I, I decided, well, you know, I think I'll, I'll run for office and um, I'll just keep my law practice going and then after five o'clock, before it gets dark, I'll get out and start handing out some cards. Because that was my recollection of what politics was about uh, at that point, because my, when my dad ran for Solicitor General the first time, uh, he, he actually had been appointed to office by Marvin Griffin. Marvin Griffin had, uh, was a good friend of my grandfather's, and he, um, he asked my grandfather if he would like to be a judge because the, the judge died in, the, in that, that circuit. And my, my grandfather said, no, why don't you appoint the Solicitor General to judge, Kerry Skelton, and uh, appoint my son to be Solicitor General. And so that's how he got to be appointed. <clears throat> but to, within two years, he had to uh, run for reelection uh, because it was in the middle of the term when he got appointed. And uh, he had a very difficult race against uh, William Oscar Carter, who later became a good friend of mine and was a friend of my dad's too. But, but they had a vicious campaign against each other. In my recollection of that, I was only about eight, eight or 10 years old. This was in 1958, so I was 10 years old. And uh, I remember going around with my father while he was campaigning, and he'd get out and go to the, you know, the little, uh, you know, grocery stores and the gas stations and hand out cards, and I thought that's all there was to it. And so when I thought, when I decided to run for the state senate, I, I was just going to keep my law practice going. I had an associate who could do a good bit of the work, and I had this paralegal was doing a lot. And I thought, well, you know, I can just, you know, take off 5 o'clock, it doesn't get dark till about 8, and, um, you know, I'll just hand out some cards and get elected. Well, it wasn't too long after I started that, I realized that if I had any chance of winning, I was going to have to give up my law practice for that period. And fortunately, it was a short period because um, after Parks died, special election. had a special election, you only got six weeks or so to do it. So, um, so I hit the ground running and um, with Piers friends' help. Um, we. Um, you know, had a pretty sophisticated campaign. You know, most everybody was making the signs out with stencils, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, this guy um, decided we, we should do it in a much more sophisticated way. So we put up these four by eight signs all over the district. And the district ran from <coughs> Elbert County, which was, you know, uh, is pretty far away from one end to the other. Uh, the other was up near Winder. Uh, you know, of course, it, it went. It was Jackson County, but um, when you got off at Brazelton, you went. You know, went from Brazelton to um, you know almost Wilkes County or Lincoln County, and um, 
So it's a pretty long way, but we, we put these things up in a matter of a week all over the district. And it looked like I was, you know, <laughs> the man to beat at that point. And there were a lot of other people in the race. We had about eight, eight people in the race. And um, I was able to, to get in the runoff with uh, John B. O'Neill, who is a doctor in Elberton, and he's a good friend of Zell's. And um, Zell was the lieutenant governor at that time. And, um, but it, we had this runoff, and, and fortunately I was able to, to win. And, uh, and Zell called me right after um, the election and congratulated me. And he said, I want you to know, I know there were some people that were saying that I was helping John B. and, and, um, and I wasn't. But uh, I said, well, look, I, that's fine. That's over. And, and um, you know, I'm just looking forward to working with you. And um, so right away, he, he gave me some great uh, committee assignments. He made me uh, vice chairman of the Judiciary Committee, which, you know, may sound like a, a crazy thing for a freshman to, to be made vice chairman. But, you know, the problem was that they didn't have many lawyers in the legislature. Everybody's always criticizing legislature being having too many lawyers and you know, but it, there were less than twenty percent of the whole legislature were lawyers, and so in the Senate, most of the work was done uh, in the Judiciary Committee because you know that was the only place you had had you know concentration of lawyers to help write the bills and everything. I mean, of course, we had a legislative council and they did most of the actual drafting. But it was important to have somebody that had some legal knowledge um, in the on the judiciary committee. So Zell said, "Look, I, it, tell me what committees you want to be on, but I, I'm, you're gonna have to be on the judiciary committee because <laughs> I, I just don't have enough lawyers." And um, so, and then he made me vice chairman, and uh, I became fast friends with the chairman, who was Nathan Deal from Gainesville, and who, um, of course, just got elected governor. But uh, Nathan uh, and I shared a secretary in the, in the newly renovated legislative office building across the street, um, offices right next to each other, and we worked very closely on uh, the Judiciary Committee uh, issues. Another issue that I was real interested in, though, was um, toll-free countywide calling. You know, back, um, back then, um, there were so many different um, telephone companies in Georgia, and each one had their own little fiefdom. And, um, and if you called outside of that, you had to pay a long distance fee. So there are many counties, including Franklin County, where I was from. Um, I, I lived in Hart at that time, but um, Hart had the is same issue. But, uh, but Franklin is, is basically where Royston, most of Royston is. And um, there were three different um, telephone companies operating in Franklin County. So you couldn't call the school, you couldn't call sometimes cross the street without paying a long distance charge. So that was the first project I took on uh, in the state Senate was to get toll free countywide calling. Um, and at first, um, Bell, Southern Bell was on my side. They thought it was it was a fight against the bells against the small uh, companies, and um, small in, you know independent companies. Uh, but in the end, it, I had to fight Southern Bell also because the bill we came up with affected them in some ways that they thought were it was it was going in a different direction than they wanted to go. What they wanted to do was to have charge based on the distance. Um, and I don't remember all the details now, but they fought me tooth and toenail, and, and ultimately the small companies got behind it. Uh, and so I was just fighting Southern Bell. Um, and you know, I didn't give a lot of speeches in, in the state senate. I, you know, I, when I had to, I'd get down there and give one. But uh, the speech I gave on the, this toll-free countywide calling thing was when, when I was fighting Southern Bell. I had some friends, the, you know, the lobbyists for Southern Bell were friends of mine, but <clears throat> we didn't stay friends during this time <laughs> because um, I, I, I said um, in my speech, I said, Southern Bell is like the, the hog that eats all the feed in the trough and then gets in it when it gets full where nobody else can get in it. And, uh, and that became the quote of the day in the Atlanta papers. 
Uh, and I used to say after that, I said, you know, the only way rural legislators ever get quoted is by using a double negative or say an ain't or have something about a farm animal in it. You know, because they had this perception of, of rural legislators being, um, you know, country boys that didn't know anything. So they'd always <coughs> put, put their quotes in there if they had a double negative or ain't or, uh, or something about a farm animal, animal in it to make them, to ridicule them in some ways. But anyway, we, it, it, first time we took a vote on that, it failed. Um, and you know, I, I'll tell you a funny story about it too, was I, I got um, more than half of the, le of the Senate, Republican and Democrat, sign on to this bill with me. First, we formed a study committee. Zell appointed this study committee that I asked him to uh, appoint. We went around all around the state, finding out what the, you know, the, the issues were around the state. And um, so when we got back, we, we came up with this report and then introduced a bill, and I got over half the legislature, uh, half the Senate to, uh, to sign on to it. And of course, it's very popular in the House, too, because they had the same problem over there. And um, when I dropped that bill with all those names on it, Southern Bell just went crazy, you know. And so, and, and one of the people was, that I had to sign on to it was Wayne Garner. And I'll never forget what he said to me because he knew Southern Bell was against it. And Wayne was a very funny guy and uh, a good friend of mine. But he said to me, Don, I'm going to sign this bill with you, but I'm getting off it in Augusta. And what he meant by that was, <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is not to say he was being bribed, but, he, but the Southern Bell lobbyists used to take a bunch of legislators to, to the Masters every year. And so he said, I'm on this bill as long as I, I can still go to the Masters. <laughs> and he said, I'm getting off of the, in Augusta. Weren't you also on the Appropriations Committee? Yeah. Now, I, that really is something for a freshman. Yeah. Well, I got on the Appropriations Committee, but the, the big thing for me was when Zell Miller, I mean, uh, when... when um, Zell got elected governor, and, uh, and then Pierre Howard got elected lieutenant governor. And I had been one of the, the people who stuck the neck up for, for Pierre because, you remember, Joe Kennedy was uh, president pro tem at the time, and everybody thought he was going to win. Um, but Pierre had been my friend for so long, and, and I, you know, th believed in his uh, progressive philosophy. And, um, and so I just stuck my neck out and said, I'm for Pierre Howard. And, um, and you know, eventually he won. Well, right before he took office, you know, at that time, the lieutenant governor appointed all the committee chairmen. And, uh, and I told Pierre, I said, look, I, I, I would like to be chairman of the Appropriations Committee because um, I've only been in the Senate for, for three years now. And I know that's, you know, maybe a little bit unusual, but uh, I've got some ideas that I think we can reform the budget process. And, uh, and I'd like to bring more people into it. And I'd like to start working on the, the appropriations bills before the House sends it to us. Because, you know, the House has, by under the Constitution, has to initiate the bill. But that doesn't mean we can't start working on it. <laughs> and uh, I remember when we, when, ultimately, when we did start working on the appropriations bill before they sent it to us, Terry Coleman, who was the chairman in the House, came to me and said, what y'all doing? You, you don't even have that bill yet. We ain't even sent you a bill yet. <laughs> What they would do with under Speaker Murphy, you know, is they would work on it up until the bitter end, and then they'd send it to us, the Senate, and you wouldn't have time to, to really respond. And so I appointed all these subcommittees to, um, you know, to be working on different parts of it before they sent it to us. But anyway, back to how I got appointed to that job, um, <clears throat> there was uh, some controversy because um, Pierre was going to, uh, it got, word got out, and I, and I never really questioned him about this, but um, that he was going to appoint Charles Walker, who was, uh, uh, he had been in the House for a long time, but he just got elected to the Senate to be chairman of the uh, Health uh, and Human Resources Committee. And uh, people like Culver Kidd and some of the older guys who had been around for a long time started complaining and said, you know, we don't want that. You got to, you know, be here, even though he's been in the House for a while, you can't, you know, appoint him to that committee. So Pierre came to me and said, um, I know you want to be chairman of the Appropriations Committee, but look at all this criticism I'm getting about, and it ha I haven't even decided to do it, about appointing Charles Walker to be chairman. Walker had helped him in Augusta and so forth. 
And I said, okay, well, I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but I think I'm going to run for majority leader then, if that's the case, because I'd rather be chairman of the Appropriations Committee, but I think I, think I might be able to get elected majority leader. I had been um, assistant floor leader for Joe Frank Harris in um, the second year I got there, and, um, and I developed a lot of friendships and relationships with, with people in the Senate, and um, I started calling around. Wayne Garner, who I mentioned earlier, um, who was also a friend and ally of mine, had, he was already running for majority leader. And he thought he had it locked up. He thought he had Pierce support. But Pierce said, look, I, I have not committed one way or the other on, on that. If you want to do it, you do what you have to do, but I'm not going to help you. And uh, so I started making calls, and I called a lot of the new members. And one of them was Sonny Perdue, who was a new Democratic member from Bonaire. And I called uh, a lot of other people uh, and, and, and started piling up names of commitments for people who were, would support me to be majority leader. And, um, and then I decided to call Wayne and tell him about it. And, he, and he, when he picked up the phone, he said, whoa, man, you've been making some calls, haven't you? <laughs> I said, yeah, I have. But, um, you know, I, I just wanted to talk to you and let you, I didn't want to do this behind your back. I mean, I'd started earlier in the day, but I, I was, you know, it, it, people had called him who had already committed to him, you know. And, um, but I had, I had gotten up about 20-something uh, commitments. And, um, and there were, the, the, the Senate didn't have but 56 members. And um, I forget how many Democrats there were at the time, but this is all just Democrats. And um, so I had a really good shot at doing it. And so he uh, said, we need to meet, and let's meet with Peer. So we went down and, and met with Peer, and, um, and, you know, he, Wayne had helped Peer in his election also. You know, he started out running himself as, as for lieutenant governor, and he dropped out of the race and threw his support behind Peer. And um, so I, I, I told Peer that, look, I, I'd rather be chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and I'll drop out of the race if we can, you know, reach that. Uh, commitment, and um, and so ultimately that's how I got appointed, was showing I had enough support, you know, for majority leader, to where it wouldn't be controversial uh, for him, and um, but then at the same time Nathan Deal uh, decided he wanted to run for president pro tem. Now this was a, an issue because um, Terrell Starr was running for for president pro tem. Terrell had been chairman of the Appropriations Committee in, 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 uh, under Zell Miller. And um, he felt that when Peer announced that he was going to appoint me chairman of the Appropriations Committee, that undercut him because he wouldn't have a place to go if he didn't win President Pro Tem. Um, and I threw my support behind Nathan. Uh, you know, he and I have been close friends, and I thought, you know, we needed some new blood and um, and some progressive, uh, progressive uh, approach, and um, at that time Nathan was a moderate. <laughs> He's not as moderate as he was because <laughs> he switched parties, and he, you have to do what you have to do, I guess. But um, but so but Nathan got elected, and then then Peer set up a new committee that he appointed chair, uh, Na uh, Terrell to be chairman of. But um, so that's how that kind of worked out. But, but Nathan and I and Wayne Garner were the subcommittee or the conference committee on the appropriations uh, debate with the House. Mm -hmm. And so the three of us worked very closely together. Um, and we, we passed a bill uh, out, of, out of the Senate on, uh, on the reform of the budget process. Uh, I had put together a, a, a committee of outside experts um, including uh, Donald Ratajkowski, who was at, at that time a, a very important e economist from Georgia State, uh, Tom Loth, who's now the dean of the uh, School of Public and International Policy School here, um, SPIA, uh, was on it, and they had somebody from McKinsey and Company. Um, we had four or five people, and they helped us put together this uh, bill for reforming the budget process. And um, 
it, we took really a new approach. I thought we were going to have trouble with the house, and at first they, they were grumbling about it, but then they got together with us, and we worked all the differences out, and, and they decided they were for it too. So we passed it in, in um, um, my last year in the, in the uh, state senate, in 1992, and it really was a pretty, pretty strong bill. Uh, but when he got to Zell, he, he called me uh, after the session was over when he was looking at the bills, whether he's going to sign them or not, and told me that he had decided to veto the bill uh, for different reasons. And um, I don't remember what they were now, but uh, I know that when they took it up again the next year, they started with that bill and, and then passed another one that was to his liking. And uh, so anyway, I feel like I was involved heavily with the reformation of the budget process because of that. And also, I, I changed the, the, what the Senate did uh, with, in their Appropriations Committee by setting up these subcommittees who really looked into, in, in depth into each of the issues. Because the way it worked beforehand was when the House sent it over, really the Senate didn't have very much time with the bill. And what they would do is get in a small conference room uh, next to the Appropriations Committee uh, chair's office. And you had, if you wanted to get something in the budget, you had to go knock on the door, more or less. I mean, you people stand out in line and you go in and talk to the, the, um, the Green Door Committee. I, don't, I forget what they called it. It wasn't, uh, that's what they called it in the House, but it's a small subcommittee uh, of the, it was the only subcommittee they had in the, in the Appropriations Committee. And if you wanted, I remember I, I wanted to get, uh, they were trying to close Hart State Park, which is in my district. And I went to the Appropriations Committee and got them to add three more cabins there. And so it saved the park. <clears throat> but I'll never forget the sort of humiliation you had to go through to, to uh, speak to this big group of about 10, 10 um, senior members to get them to put something in the budget. But that's what the whole process was about. Was it wasn't looking into the whole state budget. You were just looking into you know, what, you could, what you could put in different people's districts. And, um, and I felt like that was not the right approach. And, and then later, um, you know, what we proposed was passed in, uh, in most of the substantive part. But those are the main things I, I was involved in. I, I handled a lot of uh, legislation for Zell. Uh, one was the um, State Hobbs Act, which was um, uh, this crime, creating a crime for uh, public official abuses. I remember at that time, uh, Bob Barr was the, uh, the uh, U.S. attorney in Atlanta, and he had just prosecuted um, that congressman, um, I can't think of his name right now, but um, from the 4th District, got Ben Jones beat um, after he got indicted. You might think of his name. Pat Swindle. Pat Swindle, that's who it was. And um, Barr had prosecuted him um, and, uh, and a few other people, and, and we met with Barr to talk with him about, uh, you know, some this legislation. Zell got me and a couple of other people involved. And, um, and so we got that passed. I also did a lot of work with uh, the Attorney General, Mike Bowers. Uh, he had a, several pieces of legislation I handled for him. But th you know, those were the kinds of things that, uh, that I was involved in the, in the State Senate. But I, I really wanted to, uh, and, and I have to say that you know, I enjoyed my time in the State Senate more than anything I'd ever done in my life because it was uh, you know, something substantive something that you could do and make a difference on. And, um, and the, you know, there wasn't much partisanship going on. I mean, I worked as, as closely with some Republicans as I did with, you know, some of my Democratic uh, colleagues. Uh, Skin Edge who was one in particular. He and I hit it off very well. Uh, Mike, um, I'm, I'm getting old and I can't remember uh, names right off the bat, but, um, but there were several other uh, Republicans who were more progressive. Mike Egan. Mike Egan. Thank you. I'm glad I brought you along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike Egan was a um, very smart guy and, and progressive guy. Um, you know, things have changed so much now. Uh, you know, you just don't have people 
you know, Democrats and Republicans working together on anything. But, I, you know, if I wanted to do a bill, whether it was this countywide toll-free calling or appropriations uh, or budget process um, revision, I'd go to Skin and get him to help because he, he was, he later became the minority leader, but he was, uh, at that time, Coverdale was the minority leader. And, um, and I work with Coverdale, too, a lot. E even when, when I got elected to Congress and he got elected to the U.S. Senate, um, we were always very cordial friends. When I got appointed ambassador later um, in 98, he, uh, Coverdale, was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, then chaired by Jesse Helms. And, um, and, and Paul um, and Max Cleland, both came to the committee and testified on my behalf. Paul wrote a nice letter. And Helms was very nice to me, too. Uh, you know, he, he um, you know, was a very harsh partisan in a lot of ways. But for the job that I had, and I'll talk about this in, in just a little bit, but uh, was being the chief textile negotiator and that carried the rank of ambassador with it, um, he was very much in favor of, you know, the textile programs and, and um all the textile industry was behind me, so it was easy for him to support me. But he gave me a, uh, a real glowing introduction. And but I, I, I say this because of Paul. Paul and I got to know each other in the state senate, and then he he was appointed by George uh, Herbert Walker Bush to be to direct the Peace Corps. Um, but before that, we had had a good cordial relationship, and he was a good friend of Pierre Howard's too, um, and, and of course Zell's as well. Um, and you know, it just shows how much difference there is now between the way it was then. But I decided um, that I really wanted to uh, to do uh, something more in international and national security issues. And also, I was having a hard time um, financially when I was practicing law and uh, and and spending half my time, literally, uh, the two years that I was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, I spent half my time on uh, state senate work and the pay for that was ten thousand dollars a year and um, it, you know it just the numbers didn't work and uh, I had uh, some good people working for me in my law office but you know if you, you, you just really uh, couldn't make ends meet that's the reason there weren't so many lawyers in the legislature because if a lawyer sells his time and if you're almost giving it away somewhere else there ain't that many hours in the day so um, I decided I wanted to have a full-time job in, in, in politics, uh, not necessarily a career, but uh, I, I just you know, felt like I couldn't pay my obligations and, and still um, you know, stay in the state senate and, and, uh, and keep my law practice and not commit malpractice. <laughs> so uh, I decided to run for Congress when uh, Doug Bernard, um, announced that he was going to retire. He was from Augusta and had been um, congressman there for I think about 16 years. 16 years. Yeah, and um, along with Ed Jenkins, I think they may come in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Ed decided he was going to retire. And so um, Nathan Deal and I both decided to run at the same time. Actually, he, he decided a little bit after I did because um, Ed didn't announce he was going to retire until kind of late. And, um, but Sanford Bishop also ran at that time. Um, he, he had been in the state senate with us. Mac uh, Collins was, uh, ran as a Republican, of course. And all of us got elected. Um, it was a big turnover that year. Mm -hmm. um, but that was in 1992. And um, Bill Clinton also got elected in 1992. And of course, we were all very happy that Clinton uh, won. Uh, I think my career would have lasted a lot longer if, if, uh, if Bush had won, <laughs> George Herbert Walker Bush had won that year. But I liked Clinton, and I thought he did a good job. I mean, I still think he did a terrific job. Um, you know he's he may not go down as one of the great presidents for a number of reasons, but uh, but he certainly uh, on the on budget issues and all of that. Um, I think he did a really good job. Um, when I was running for Congress, I ran on uh, like Ross Perot, 
uh, that helped get Clinton elected, uh, you know, that we need to reduce the deficit. Um, it was going over $200 billion. That doesn't sound like much now, but back then that was, uh, it, that sounded like an awful lot. And of course it was a lot more, you know, as a percentage of the, of the uh, GDP. But um, <coughs> since uh, I had been chairman of the Appropriations Committee and, you know, had been heavily involved in re reforming the budget process, and, and living through a time when it was a um, severe budget crisis, not as bad as the one now, but in 1991, it was a terrible budget year. We had really uh, revenue dropped significantly. I, I'll never forget, we used to go to the governor's mansion and meet with Zell and with um, uh, Tom Murphy and, you know, with the, the leaders in the Senate would go with the leaders in the House and we'd try to work things out with, um, you know, in that crisis. We, it was in August of, uh, of 91 and that was before Clinton had announced that he was going to run. But one day he, he showed up at one of our meetings uh, there at the, at the governor's mansion. And, um, and Zell introduced him to all of us because they had gotten to know each other as um, on the you know, the Southern Governors Association and the, um, maybe Democratic Governors Association. And uh, he spoke very highly of him, and, um, but I'll never forget that. It was the first time I met him. And um, so um, when I came to, got elected to Congress, I had been running on several things, but one was trying to balance the budget. And this is why I'll talk about the budget issue and the budget vote I had. In, um, you know, shortly after we got there in 93, um, the president uh, came up to, to Congress and gave a budget speech um, and said, look, we, you know, we're going to have to do several things. Uh, we're going to have to raise taxes uh, and we're going to have to do some severe cuts. And so he tried to balance it out with his budget proposal that, that went before the Congress. And, um, you know, I, during the campaign, I never took any kind of pledge that I was not going to raise taxes. Uh, you know, every time I get asked about that, I say, I think you, you can't do that. That's not responsible. You can't, you know, you have to, you have to. But I, it, then I would say, I don't, I don't think we're going to need to uh, because I think we can, you know, uh, cut enough out of the budget to, to do it that way. And um, when I, you know, back then, and I, th I guess they're still doing it, but they used to send everybody to the Kennedy School in, in, in Boston and in Harvard, um, and where you'd get <coughs> briefings on every subject under the sun. But of course, that year, uh, the big issue was budget, uh, because everybody was very concerned about, um, you know, the rise in deficit. And, uh, and that's when I found out that it could not be done. Um, you know, without some tax increases. Um, because I was hearing from not just, you know, Democratic economists, I was hearing from a broad range of people. And they just said, you know, if you look at the budget, uh, we're $200 billion in the hole. And um, that's not to mention the, the debt, but it's just the annual deficit. And, uh, and the whole Pentagon budget at that time was about 300, I think under 300 billion, I think it was about 250. And, um, you know, about half the budget was in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, entitlement programs. That's under, under the law. You really can't, you know, money is going into those programs from, uh, from those of us who are paying, you know, payroll taxes. You can't really cut that back uh, in, a, in a way that would affect the budget. So you have to look at the discretionary money. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people say, well, we're going to get rid of foreign aid. Well, foreign aid is about 1% of the budget, if that. Um, and you, you, you know, they're just, fraud, waste, and abuse was another thing that people used to say. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of the fraud, waste, and abuse. Well, you know, if you took, what I used to say when I was going around talking to constituents about it after I figured out, you know, what kind of problem we were really in, is if you took the entire Pentagon and shut it down, just got rid of our national defense altogether, you still would have a deficit. You know, you can't, you know, let's talk about fraud, waste, and abuse. It's not all in the, you know, health and human resources, um, you know, department. Uh, um, 
you know, in, uh, environmental protection, you could eliminate that, and that, that'll get rid of about maybe, you know, just a very small percentage. But you can't, you couldn't resolve the problem. And then others would say, well, look, we're just going to grow out of it. Let's uh, reduce taxes, and then we'll grow out of it. Well, that was impossible, because at that time, Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the um, Federal Reserve, wouldn't allow inflation to get over 3% or wouldn't allow growth rates to get over 3% because if they got over 3%, he'd worry about inflation. And so you'd have, to, you'd have to get the growth rate up to 5 or 6% in order to grow out of it. So it just was not possible to do it that way. And the only way you could do it was with, with some tax increases and some, um, in a, in some healthy budget uh, cuts. So when they presented the, the way it works uh, in the Congress is you, you, know, you pass a budget resolution, and then um, you know, once you get that budget resolution, that's, that's what you've got to work with, and then it has to be reconciled with taxes and with um, cuts in the end. So the, the big vote was on the reconciliation. You hear about reconciliation a lot now because they use it for different things, but this is the budget reconciliation bill. And um, all of us, except for Roy Rowland from Georgia, voted for the budget resolution, I including Nathan. I keep mentioning him because uh, you know he was a close friend of mine. He and I voted exactly alike for the first six months we, we were in Congress. I remember one time Sanford Bishop came up to us and, for some vote and said, how are you guys going to vote on this? And he wasn't saying, you know, like you might walk up to a group and say, get each one's opinion. He knew that we were going to vote exactly alike, and he wanted to know how the two of us were going to vote on it. And um, so all of us voted for it, except for Roy and um, uh, uh, in the Democratic uh, group. And at that time, I think we had um, two Republicans. Um, uh, Newt and Matt Collins, and I don't know if there's any more at that time, but uh, but most of us were Democrats, and and um, so we we passed the resolution, and uh, and that's when things started getting controversial. Uh, at the beginning of the summer, I think the budget resolution passed in in the spring, but you know with all the rhetoric that was going on, you know the. Um, talk radio and everything was uh, was just piling up at that point. Nathan decided to, to vote against the budget uh, in 93, in August of 93. He had voted for the budget resolution, which, you know, assumed that you were going to have these cuts and these tax increases. <clears throat> but uh, Buddy Darden and I in Sanford, um, you know, and, and, and of course Roy had already voted against the resolution even, um, you know, we're planning to vote for it. But as things started moving during the summer of 93, uh, I started moving away from it because I didn't like uh, mainly the, the, um, the energy tax, the, you know, the gas tax that was put on there. Um, and, you know, I felt like that was not necessary. But, you know, you have to vote at things in a package. and. Um, so I started moving away from it, and there were several of us uh, freshman Democrats from all over the country who started moving away from it. Nathan had already jumped ship totally, but, uh, but the rest of us, you know, were still debating what to do. And um, it, toward the end, you know, I was moving away from voting uh, for it, thinking that we could vote, vote it down and then come back and um, you know, bring in a few Republicans and, you know, you know some, and get a little bit more moderate package, take out the gas tax. But I, I knew that we had, there had to be tax in there in order for it to, to balance, ultimately. It's not going to balance, in, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning, but ultimately there had to be some, um, some tax uh, increases. Um, so the day before the, the um, or, or the day of the, the uh, the budget reconciliation uh, vote, which I think was August 5th of uh, 93. We were getting ready to go on um, uh, recess, so-called district work period, um, and right after that, right after this vote, um, 
I was still debating it, but I had, you know, was leaning heavily against against it, or thinking about I was going to vote, you know, vote it down or vote, you know, vote or no. And um, during the day, I got started getting calls from all over the place. Um, one, one call I got was from from Pierre and um, Lewis Massey. Lewis Massey was his uh, chief of staff at the time, and uh, and they said. We just call and see how you doing, Don. <laughs> How's it going today? Mm -hmm. And I said I'm in a high st a state of high anxiety right now. Mm -hmm. And um, but that was that was one of the friendly calls I got. I also got calls from um, a lot of calls from Al Gore, you know, the vice president. And one time I was talking to him, and um, my administrative assistant looked in the door, and. Um, she said, the president's on line one. And so I said to Gore, I said, the president's on line one. Can I take that call? And, uh, and I hear, heard him say in the background, hey, are you calling Don Johnson? <laughs> they were in the same room together. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Butler Derrick, who was a congressman just across the river in South Carolina, had been there. He was one of the Watergate um, babies, they called them, the people who got elected after Watergate in 1974. And um, he had been, he's part of the leadership, and he was in my office talking to me about this, Bill, because he, you know, he comes from the same territory I do. He, he's from Edgefield in South Carolina, but he, you know, had been around for a long time. And, uh, but he was sitting there when I was talking to Gore and then to President Clinton, and, um, and then a couple, of, and, and I told, um, it, Clinton said to me, what would it take to get you to vote for this? And I said, well, first of all, you know, I don't like the bird rule, the effect it has on, um, on this proposal that we had to, in, to put a cap on the growth of health care. You know, that was uh, one of the, the major problems of the budget was the growth of health, uh, rising cost of health care. And, uh, and, and we wanted to put a cap on it. In fact, we did in the House bill. Um, but it, when it got to the Senate, the Byrd Rule, which is named after Robert Byrd from West Virginia, said that in a reconciliation package, the Senate, uh, you know, it, it would not be germane to have anything other than purely budget items. And putting a cap on the growth of health care costs was not, um, not possible um, under that Byrd Rule. So, so the Senate took it out. And, uh, and so I said to Clinton, I said, you know, if they can put that back in there, and get that passed, because that's really would would help solve the problem. Um, and he said, "Well, look, I don't have any control over that. That's the Senate's problem. Um, would it help if I, if you could talk to George Mitchell, who George Mitchell at the time was the Senate Majority Leader?" I said, "Not really, but you know, if, a few minutes after we hung up, Mitchell calls me, and I could tell he didn't want to talk to me, you know, but he was being forced to because the president asked him to call me, and." Um, and he sa I said, look, you know, is there any way you can, you know, waive this bird rule to get this, you know, the cap on the growth of health care? Um, and he said, I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I'll do the best I can. But, you know, we're going to take it up in a separate bill when the, after we pass this budget um, uh, reconciliation and you know, we come back in September. And, um, but I can't promise it. You know, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And we can't put it in this bill. So we hung up, and um, a few minutes later, somebody else called, and, uh, and Butler was still sitting there in my office, and he said, who is that, the Pope? <laughs> because I'd already had a call from the president, the vice president, and the Senate majority leader. And, um, but after a while, um, I called up some of my um, freshman Democratic colleagues, and, and, um, and we had already been talking, you know, about what we were going to do. And, and so the three of us, uh, a guy named Eric Fingerhut from, from Ohio, and um, a guy from Washington, whose name I'll think of, man, I'm not, I can't rely on you for this one, but, but the three of us went to see Dick Gephardt. And this was uh, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and the vote was going to be at like at 6.30 or 7. And um, we went to see Gephardt. And, uh, and we said, look, we're sorry, but we, we just, we're not going to be able to vote for this. We think that, you know, maybe if we can vote it down, we, we're very much in favor of deficit reduction. Um, but we, we think that, you know, we can come up with a better bill. 
And if we vote this down, there's a possibility that we can do that. And uh, you, know, you have to have a budget. So um, you know, if we vote this down, we'd have to come up with something else. And Gephardt said, look, I, I understand where you're coming from. And um, you know, I, I don't agree with you. I don't think that um, you can, we can get a better bill at this point because the partisanship is so rife. But, um, you know, I, I understand, I, well, you know, they didn't, he didn't try to twist our arms or anything like that. It wasn't a Tom DeLay type of uh, approach. He, he said, look, I, you know, I wish we had you, but, uh, you know, we understand. So the three of us then walked back to our respective offices and um, got ready for the vote. Chuck Tony, who is currently working here at the university, he was my press secretary at the time. He's a um, speechwriter and uh, in the public affairs section here now, but he kept coming into my office and says, have you decided what you're going to do? Have you decided what you're going to do? Because I've got these, the press is hounding me, you know. And there's one guy in particular uh, in Augusta, Georgia, uh, on the Morris newspapers, um, Augusta Chronicle, a guy named Phil Kent. You probably know him. Right. He was the editorial page editor at the time and was just a vicious, vicious uh, opponent of anything that Clinton did or any, and later anything that I did. But at this time, he was wanting me to, to say that I was going to vote against it. And so I told Chuck, this was really right before I walked over to the vote. I said, okay, you can go ahead and tell him I'm planning to vote against it. I've already told Gephardt. And um, <clears throat> the speaker, Tom Foley, you know, had never contacted me about it. You know, he's a very nice guy, but he, you know, maybe this is the difference between Gephardt and Foley and, and Pelosi and, um, and the Republican side, you know, DeLay and, and Boehner and those guys. They just, you know, they didn't get into you know, um, twisting arms. And um, since we'd already told him we were going to vote against it, I said, okay, you can tell Kent that I'm going to vote uh, against it. So then I get up to start walking across the, the street. Uh, my, build, my office was in the Cannon Building, and I, I was on the ground floor and just, you know, walked straight out. My son, uh, Cleet, uh, was up that, there that summer working uh, as a tour guide at the Capitol. He was a freshman in college, uh, just finished his freshman year at Harvard. And, um, and he had been up there working, and of course he was off since it was so late in the day as far as the tour guide job. But he and several of some of my staff members were going to walk over and watch the vote from the gallery. And I hadn't seen him all day, and he said to me, uh, Daddy, how are you going to vote on this bill? And I said, well, I think I'm going to vote against it. He said, you are? Why are you going to do that? And I said, well, I think that we can, you know, if we vote it down, I think we can come back with a, you know, a more bipartisan approach and, and get a bill that would pass that, you know, takes out the gas tax, takes out, you know, maybe lowers some of the taxes and increases some of the cuts, you know, just to make it a little bit more moderate bill, but still have an effective bill. He said, oh, okay. So uh, we all walked over together. He goes up in the gallery with the other staff members, and, I'm, and I decided to go in. I don't want to talk to anybody in that, on the House floor. So I go sit in the middle of one of those rows, uh, you know, far away from, and I, I didn't want anybody to, to contact me at that point. I was already made up my mind I was going, what I was going to do. So the unfortunate thing was that I had to sit through two speeches um, by Newt Gingrich and Dick Armey. And they got down there and were just railing against this thing and said, this is a, you know, this is going to put us in a deeper recession. It's going to basically end civiliz Western civilization as we know it. I mean, you know, they, I'm exaggerating here a little bit, but, but if you go back and you read their speeches, it, it was just going to be the worst thing that ever happened uh, in America if this bill passes. You know, it's just going to cause, you know, you can't raise taxes in, during a recession. You know, you can't, you know, it's not going to uh, increase the, um, sur you know, the surplus or, or create a surplus. It's not going to do anything but make things a lot worse. And there's no way you can raise taxes at all uh, in, in this kind of environment. And, and literally, they, you know, the description of what was going to happen, it was like a pop apocalypse now, you know. Um, and I got to thinking, I'm going to be voting with these guys, and I'm thinking that, uh, that they're going to 
come back afterwards and let anybody in the, on the Republican um, you know, caucus vote with Democrats to, that will raise any taxes at all? Well, you know, I've completely fooled myself. And I got to thinking that, look, if I vote against this, it'll, you know, it, it'll be purely political cowardice. That, um, you know, I'm doing this nothing, no other reason to, but to save my hide. Uh, because it, it clearly we can't get a bill that reduces the deficit other than this one. Because, you know, we, the Democratic caucus is already, you know, very diverse. You know, you had very conservative people uh, on that bill who voted against it, by the way. Um, a lot of them did. Now, some of the ones that had a little bit more courage voted for it. But, um, you know, it was, um, it, it, I had just fooled myself if I, if I was thinking that, that, that there were going to be any uh, Republicans who moved over and voted with us on anything that was, you know, it, it did the least bit of damage to the deficit. So about that time, I get a page comes over and sees me about halfway, you know, down the bench and said, you have a, a call here. And it said, and I looked at the message and it said, the president wants to speak to you on, on uh, booth two back in the, you know, in the caucus room. <coughs> so I said, uh, okay, I'll go talk to him because I had decided at that point, you know, that the, the basis for the reason that I told my son that I was going to vote for it had turned out to be wrong, if not a lie. And um, so I went back to him and I, I, I got on the phone with him and I, you know, talked to him two or three times that day and, and you know, it never said I was going to vote for it. In fact, decided to vote against it. Um, and I said, look, the, th the things that are most concerning to me is uh, it, we need more deficit reduction, and I think that you can uh, increase the, uh, the budget cuts by $10 uh, billion, um, you know, with, uh, without a bill like this, and that um, we need to, I, I would like for you to commit that you'll support a, a cap on, on uh, health care costs rising. And there was one other thing, but it wasn't anything like building a bridge in my district, you know, or anything like that. You know, it, 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 he, he, one time he said, look, I, I'll do anything within the presidential, my presidential authority to help you get reelected. And I, all I could think of was, um, you know, there ain't nothing you can do to help me get reelected. You know, you, you're so disliked in, in my district. That uh, the only thing you can do is stay away, you know. But certainly, I don't want any help from you. But I would like to have these commitments. That way, I can at least say I got something for, um, you know, for committing to you that I was going to vote for it. And he said, "Okay." So those three things, and, I, and I've got them written down on, on the back of that pages uh, thing in my in my safe at home. I'm going to give them to the Russell Library here. Um, <laughs> And so I, I decided, I, then I went down and I told Foley and Gephardt that I was going to vote for it when, it when it came up. I changed my mind <laughs> and I decided to vote for it. And um, so when the, when the vote came up, I didn't wait. I just went right over there and voted and then I left the chamber. And of course it went on for a long time and some of the people, uh, you know, were waiting to see how many votes they were going to have before they, you know, put their name down. And so it passed by one vote. Uh, you know, Your vote. My, my vote, you know, I mean, you could say it was my vote, and, and a lot of people did. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I, I'm really proud of that vote. Um, you know, it, it took me a long time to get there, and there, there are not many times when you are swayed by the arguments that you hear from the, the floor of the House. Mm -hmm. But I was swayed by what Gingrich and Army said, you know, in a negative way. That, um, that convinced me that I had to vote uh, for it. So after that, um, I had been scheduled to go uh, jog with the president the next day. And, um, and when I walked back into my um, office, people were cheering in there, you know, because it, the, it had passed by the time I got back. And, uh, and they were cheering that it passed. But they thought I'd voted against it. 
And, and when I told them that I voted for it, their faces just dropped. <laughs> you know, I'll never get Beverly Bell was my AA, and, and you know, she, she was smiling when I got there, and she had the biggest scowl on her face, you know, <laughs> uh, after I told her that. And then when I called my wife and told her, she was mad at me, and, you know, it was, um, I had a few people that, you know, said, look, we're proud of you for, for voting this way. And, but it, it was a really tough sledding after that. I had scheduled, I think, 20 town hall meetings for the month of August. I had like two, you know, two or three a week. Um, and, um, and they were all, uh, I'd say, hell. Um, you know, m a lot of people were out doing Codells, you know, these uh, congressional delegation trips abroad, and some people were down at the beach, some people were at home with their family. I was out on the campaign trail fulfilling my promise to do all these town hall meetings. And I had the same group of people, these um, ditto heads from Rush Limbaugh's show, you know, they call them ditto heads. And they would follow me around everywhere I went and just try to disrupt the meeting. And I would be up there like a school teacher trying to show about the budget and how, you know, where it all went and how we couldn't just create this by waste, fraud, and abuse and, you know, getting rid of the welfare and getting rid of, um, you know, foreign aid. It was not a simple thing. And um, I had one meeting down in uh, Grovetown, which is near Augusta. If you know where where Grovetown is, in Columbia County, and the mayor down there was a good friend of mine, and he um, he was kind of the MC or going to be the MC of it. I had another lawyer friend from Augusta, Ben K, down there who also was helping or you know helping me in that area. Um, but the uh, there was a, a a talk radio guy down there in, in, from Columbia County and had this radio show, and I can't think of his name right now. Maybe you can think of it for me. But he, he and I got along very well, but he was trying to be like Rush Limbaugh. And um, I would go on his show all the time and, um, you know, in field calls and everything. And, and he and I had a very good relationship. But right before that, um, you know, right after that budget vote, he just whipped up the whole Columbia County. And, uh, and they came, you know, like, uh, you know, a mob to this, uh, I think it was an old schoolhouse, and um, showed up at this meeting. And when I got there, a policeman came up to me and said, do you want me to escort you? And I said, no way I don't want you escorting me. And um, so, I, because I didn't want to be seen escorting by a police <laughs> officer amongst my constituents, you know. And, uh, and I got in there, and they, they just would not stop screaming, you know, and they had all these crazy signs. And they, I'll never forget this woman who's right in the front row, stood up yelling, liar, liar, pants on fire. You know, <laughs> it was just like children that had been, you know, I don't know, on some kind of drug or something. And, uh, <clears throat> but it was just maddening. And um, I, um, you know, tried to start and, and, you know, explain the vote and explain the budget and everything, but it, this was just impossible. And um, so finally it ended, and uh, we walked out of there, my wife and, um, and, you know, a couple of aides, and Jane Kidd was there. You know, she was, my, um, she was my district director. She had been my campaign manager in the, in, the, um, in the first election. But, you know, Jane, of course, is the chairman of the Democratic Party, or I guess is the director of the Democratic Party in Georgia now and um, later became a state representative. And, but she was there with us and, um, and Ben Kay and, and this mayor of Grovetown who felt so sorry because most of these people weren't from Grovetown. Uh, you know, they'd come from Augusta and wherever else this, this radio call guy uh, reached. And um, the next day on Paul Harvey, he talked about my town hall meeting uh, in Grovetown. And he said, you know, I don't know if I can imitate him, but you know how he used to talk. As um, he said, he was had to be escorted out by the police, and so uh, you know, of course, that was not true. And I had my staff call and correct him and everything, so he dropped that f before the end of the day. But uh, but that was the kind of uh, you know town hall meetings we had. We had one here in Athens that was uh, was pretty raucous too. But you know, I, I had them all literally all over the district and. Um, 
and they were all planned before this budget vote happened. <laughs> and I, mm -hmm. and I, I wasn't sure how I was going to vote when I planned them, but it, you know, if, if I had voted against it, they would have been much more pleasant. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's uh, some of the issues that. Well, you were also selected by Speaker Foley to serve as a member of the Speaker's Working Group on Policy. Yeah, um, uh, Buddy Darden told me that I was selected to, to be on that committee to be the token redneck. <laughs> and uh, I think there might have been some truth in that, but it, it was, it, it, I had wanted to get, be on the Ways and Means Committee. And I made a strong effort to, to get on that committee. I, of course, I went and talked to Foley, and Foley was not the one who decided, but, uh, but he could have helped me if he wanted to. Um, the main person was Dan Rostenkowski. And, um, and Ed Jenkins, who had been a really good friend of mine, uh, took me to meet Rostenkowski. Of course, I'd met him 30 years before, but um, when I was a young staffer, but he, he said, look, we need people on this committee who can take some tough votes. And we don't know how, how you are. We don't know how thick your skin is or how, you know, how tough you are. So um, I was mainly interested in it because of my interest in international trade. The Ways and Means Committee handles international trade. Um, but he was correct that uh, there were going to be some tough votes dealing with the deficit and so forth. And I, and I think I would have passed that test if, if – uh, if it had been after that. But, um, but Foley was looking for some people, uh, you know, from the freshman class, and I think there were two of us on that, uh, that policy committee, to get, you know, get input from everybody. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very interesting committee to me because I got to hear, you know, the old guard talk, uh, like Rostenkowski and Jack Brooks from uh, Texas and uh, you know, and then a lot of the other, uh, you know, people who had, hadn't been there that long, but they were very influential. Most of the people who were uh, helping to develop policy uh, were on that committee. And I'll never forget, uh, before the budget votes happened and we had a meeting of that committee, Ross Sienkowski was saying, um, look, I, I, I know it's tough on some of you young people to vote uh, like this. Um, you know, it's easy for me to say vote for it because, you know, I got tenure here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the ironic, sad ironic thing about that statement was that he lost in the next election, not because of the tax vote, but because of the, um, his um, ethical issues with the post office and a lot of other things. But um, he was an interesting character. I was sorry to see him go down like that. But... Um, he had done a lot of good things. He and Reagan had worked very closely together on, uh, on, you know, tax reform and other things. So it was a sad day. And then listening to Jack Brooks talk, uh, Jack had been there for, um, I guess, thirty, at least thirty years. You know, he's from from uh, Texas and was a founding, uh, I don't know what they call it, but a, a partner or something in the um, in the NRA. Mm -hmm. He was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and the, uh, another big vote I had was on uh, banning of assault weapons, and, uh, and Jack Brooks decided to vote to ban them because, you know, he didn't use, he was a big hunter, but he didn't use assault weapons for that purpose, and uh, the NRA came after him, and of course he lost also. And Foley was, uh, had been a founding, I, I keep saying founding, like founding father of the NRA, but he was a very strong supporter. Uh, of the NRA and um, and he lost too because at, at that time and, and a lot of it was because of the NRA. So I, I, this would be a, a lead in to the, the assault weapons vote, which was a big big vote in my uh, period there. Uh, I had decided to oppose uh, assault weapons or, or be in favor of banning assault weapons during my campaign. But I had uh, been opposed to the Brady Bill. And because the Brady Bill at that time, um, it, it, you know, during the campaign was nothing but a waiting period bill. And I had always voted against waiting periods. I never thought there was any value in that. Uh, if somebody, you know, if it was to get you to cool down before you, you know, bought a gun, then you just go get a knife, I, I would think. <laughs> and so uh, when I was in the state senate, I had an A rating from the uh, NRA. They always supported me. 
but uh, but I didn't like the 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 lobbyists <laughs> for the NRA, it, and I, I was a little bit uncomfortable being endorsed so heavily by them. But I did happen to believe that waiting periods didn't do any good, and the Brady Bill was essentially a waiting period bill. So I said, okay, I, I'll if I'm going to vote against it, but I'm going to vote in favor of banning assault weapons because I just don't see the point in assault, assault weapons. And you know, we already banned machine guns. It's similar to that. Um, so when, uh, you know, bef uh, the Brady Bill vote came up before. Now, they actually improved the Brady Bill where it was not just a waiting period, but it was also a background check bill. And um, so you could either do the waiting or you could do a ba have somebody do an instant background check. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. But since I'd already come out, uh, uh, you know, against the Brady Bill, when it came up for a vote, this is one of the votes that I regret. I felt like I had to vote against it, even though it was changed because it was still called the Brady Bill, but now it was more of a background check uh, to see if you had a criminal record or you had a mental health record or something like that. Uh, so I felt bad that I didn't vote for that, but I, I did so because I had made a commitment in the um, in the, during the campaign that I was going to be opposed to, I mean, uh, going to vote against the Brady Bill. Now, it passed um, without my vote. And then I, I got, I was, some of my friends in Congress were, you know, of course, Southern Democrats and some from Western Democrats, like uh, from Oklahoma and so on. And they were all members of the Sportsman Caucus. And I think I joined the Sportsman Caucus. I don't remember exactly, but. But I hung out with a lot of them, and I went to a lot of the events they had. And I've always been a hunter. I, you know, I'm certainly in favor of, you know, hunting and sport, sporting equipment that you have to use to hunt with. Um, so I got approached by the NRA, and they wanted to take me out to dinner. And, uh, and, and a very nice guy. It's not like the guy that used to be the NRA. I know Zell would remember who I'm talking about, but uh, the NRA guy down at the Capitol, you, you probably remember him too, a, a bald guy. Um, I don't remember his name, but anyway, I always found him a little bit offensive. But um, the, the, um, the NRA people in Washington were pretty smooth characters. And I went out to dinner with them one night, and they said, look, we want you to You've already voted uh, against the Brady Bill, so you, you've got a great rating with us. And, and we know how you were in the state Senate. You had a high rating with us. But um, we think you need to vote against the uh, assault weapon ban. And if it happens, if there's not a direct vote on it and it gets put in the crime bill, which is what, where it ultimately went, you need to vote against the crime bill. And I said, well, I'm sorry. And it, well, he before that he said, "Look, if you vote in favor, uh, uh, if you vote oppose, uh, uh, if you oppose the assault weapon bill, we will, you know, support you. You'll be our fair-haired boy. We'll we'll support you in every way. We'll you know send out postcards to all the members of the NRA, and we'll give you twenty-five thousand dollars, because that's how much money they could give as a pack, um, you know, to support a, a campaign." And, um, but if you vote in favor of the ban, we're going to come after you with everything we got. And I said, well, that, that's the way it has to be. I, I'm planning on voting uh, for the ban because I've already committed to that. Just like I committed to vote you know, against the Brady Bill, I've committed to vote for the assault weapon ban, and, uh, and I'm going to do it. Uh, you know, I can't be changed on that. I've already, you know, st staked my position on that. And they said, okay. And sure enough, I voted for the ban, and they came after me with bullets, you know, guns blazing. And um, they spent the full 25000 of course, sent out all kind of stuff to the, you know, their membership. Supported every opponent I, you know, had. There's a lot of them in the in the Republican Party, you know, that signed up to run against me after a, after the budget vote. Um, and and Charlie Norwood, who who uh, ultimately won the Republican nomination, he said in some, in a one radio debate we had that um, 
somebody asked, well, what do you think about the machine gun ban? I said, I think we ought to do away with that, too. And I used that against him, you know, because then he, he, you know, he, you know, threw it back in my face somehow. But, uh, but you know, he would do anything for the NRA, and um, and I'm sure that had an impact on me because in, in because what the NRA did in their ads, they didn't say he's he voted to ban assault weapons, because actually in the polling that we did, it, it, there was more people who were in favor of assault weapon bans than who were against it. But the, but the um, what they did was they would run ads. This one ad I'll never forget uh, they had on the radio, um, WNGC here, that said um, it was like a Jeopardy program, and uh, they said it, you know had this one guy asking the question and somebody would answer it you know, and one of the questions the last question was who has missed the most science committee meetings, Don Johnson, who is Don Johnson. You know, so, it, it, and then it, you couldn't tell who paid for the ad. And it was nothing about guns, but it was just, you know, this negative barrage of, of um, you know, whatever they could dig up to throw at me. And, um, and on the science committee, you know, our science committee used to have hearings for anybody who wanted to bring somebody from their district that had a new gadget they wanted to <laughs> show off. And so, I, true, I didn't turn up for a lot of those. Uh, I went to all the main meetings, but not, mm -hmm. you know, you could have a number of hearings that I, I didn't make. But um, so that's how they came against me. And I, I had one reporter tell me who had checked it out, and I never have checked this out myself, but she said that the NRA put more money in my race than any other race in the country except for Tom Foley's. And they went after him with a passion. You know, and he'd been such a strong NRA supporter over the years, and they, they went after him. I had one uh, television ad that I used uh, this very dinner that I told you about. I, uh, it, and we did it in the courtroom, a uh, Madison County courtroom, where my dad tried the Lemuel Penn case. And, um, and I said in that, you know, um, my script was that, um, you know, my dad uh, went after the Ku Klux Klan in this, uh, in this very courtroom. And I was proud of him. He said, you know, he asked the jury to have the courage to do what's right. And so I've thought about that every day, you know, since, since I heard him say that. And every decision I make, and, and this is true, I, every decision I made on a tough vote or any political thing I did, I, I would always think about that. And I didn't want my uh, children to, to think of me as not having the courage that my father had, you know, at that time. And, and it did take some courage for that because I remember, uh, I'm talking about now the Lemuel Penn Ku Klux Klan, I know I'm, I'm wandering here because I'm going back to that, but when I was a kid, at 16, that's how old I was in 1964, and came home from school one day and there was a sticker on, on our back door that said, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan is watching you. you know, and it's, they didn't know the grammar too well, but it sure knew how to scale the hell out of somebody. <laughs> and, uh, and I asked my dad about that. I said, look, and I, pu I pulled the sticker off and showed it to him. And I, I saved that sticker, I've still got it today, but um, I, I, I said, should we be worried about this? And <laughs> he said, no, don't worry about that. that. You know, he just put it aside, you know. And, um, but you know, uh, they, had, they were killing people uh, around here and uh, a DA up in Jefferson got killed by, um, you know, a bootlegger. You might remember that. Uh, Fuzzy Ord. Yeah, exactly. And, it's just, and it was a good friend of my dad's and so, you know, it happens, but, um, I always thought about that, and so I used that scene to talk about the NRA. And I said, they're trying to bully people. They told me that they would give me the full $5,000 because they could give $5,000 as a corporation, but they could spend it $25,000 uh, in other ways. And, um, and they said they're going to come after me if I didn't. And, uh, and, and so I, you know, I kind of used that, that trial uh, is in comparison to the NRA. And I'm sure that infuriated them because they, they spent the whole wide against me. Mm -hmm. Now, would, you know, would that help me if I, you know, if they hadn't, it probably wouldn't have made any difference. But, um, but anyway, it was uh, one of the, the big issues in the campaign. 
Another big issue was health care, uh, you know, so-called Hillary care. And they called the present health care reform Obamacare, or they called health care reform in, the, in 93 and 94 Hillary care. And I wanted to support uh, them. I told uh, them one of the first times I met her, uh, and when it was announced that he was going to get Hillary to, uh, to work on health care, I said, I, w I would like to support you on, on this because I think it's very important that we have health care reform. But by the time it was released, you know, the, the work on that, you know, her committee, um, her group, I guess you'd say, um, it was just, it, it, it just didn't make any sense. And they'd been so secretive about the way they put it together. Um, it, it just kind of, you know, it didn't seem to me something that I could support. And so I came out against it. Uh, it never came for a vote, but if it, if, I, if it had, I would have voted against it. But that was a b still a big issue in the campaign, and people didn't know. They just they thought I, you know, voted with Clinton, you know, 99 percent of the time, which I didn't. I voted, you know, uh, my my voting record was very uh, moderate in comparison to you know uh, Clinton and the Democratic leadership. I think I had a, a voting record of around 78, 80 percent with them, uh, which was similar to what Sam Nunn's was in the, in the, in the Senate. Um, and, and if you look now at the, you know, most of the Republicans, because they, they are much more tightly controlled, uh, like Norwood, for example, he voted 98, 99 percent of the time with his leadership. Um, and, and most of the, Dem the Republicans do that. And a lot of Democrats, uh, you know, vote with leadership most of the time but not most uh, Southern <laughs> Democrats do. Um, and mine was, was pretty conservative and pretty, um, you know, uh, independent of the House leadership and the, and the president. Let's talk a minute about party politics. Yeah. The great change in Georgia. Well, yeah, there has been. Are you talking about today or uh, when I was in office? I mean, I think, would you agree that, that the Republican surge was about to begin in your last election? Definitely, definitely. I always tell people that I turned the 10th district into a Republican district. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not intentionally. But uh, certainly it's true because in, um, Certainly at the national level, you know, they still, the Democrats still control the state legislature and the governor's office up through 2002 when Roy Barnes got defeated. And then, uh, but at the federal level, of course, people have been voting for Republicans for president for a long time. But, um, but in 94, you started getting a lot of these Roosevelt, you know, New Deal Democrats. Where that live around where you and I live, uh, started voting, you know, for Republicans, and um, and and really it was a vote against Clinton in '94. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, you know, his the polling that we did showed that he, you know, he actually had gone down. You know, he won Georgia by 42 percent. You know, and and with uh, what Perot took from. From George Herbert Walker Bush, um, that gave him the state of Georgia's electoral votes, but he only had 43 percent then in '92. In in '94, when we were doing our polling, um, his his numbers in my district, uh, well, my his numbers in my district even in '92 were much lower than 43 percent, 42 percent. But in in um, in, in 94, they had gone down even further. They were in the low 30s. And the, my, the problem I had, even you know, my, my numbers in 92 had been a, a lot higher than his, uh, you know, a lot higher than, you know, Weich Fowler's. Uh, maybe not a lot higher than Weich, but higher than Weich's and, um, in, in my district. Um, but but in, 90, in the 94 election, number one, the turnout was so bad. Um, you know, uh, Norwood only got a few, couple of thousand more votes than uh, than Ralph Hudgens did in 1992, <clears throat> but I got so f many fewer votes than I did in in uh, 92 that I got swamped. Um, 
but it, it was mainly a vote against Clinton or uh, people just didn't turn out. And so you had the same people voting basically for uh, Norwood who voted for Hudgens, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a few more. And some of them, I'm sure some of those few more had voted for me than 92. But, uh, but that was really a big, uh, big change. Obviously, 90, 94 was a you know, big change election throughout the South. And one of the things it did was it got rid of uh, a lot of moderate uh, Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, most of them, in fact. I mean, Sanford Bishop was clearly a moderate, but his district was a lot, you know, more Democratic than ours was. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was the beginning of the end, even though I think if I had been able to hang on in 94, um, I would have won much bigger in 96, because mm -hmm. 96 it was, you know, a slight comeback. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think that uh, the contract with America made a difference in that election year, 1994? You know, it gave them something to talk about, but I honestly don't. I think maybe most, um, I mean, at least I should not speak for other people, for myself. I don't think it did really, uh, because we were already losing before they even came up with the contract for America. You know, I, the poll, I, the first poll I did in, uh, in 94, my numbers were so bad um, that, you know, it, it was getting closer to Clinton's numbers. And uh, even though they had, the Republicans hadn't chosen anybody, and most of them, you know, weren't, they weren't getting anything hardly, you know, because they, nobody knew who they were. But <clears throat> uh, my numbers were so bad before they came out with that contract with America, I don't think it, it had a, a big impact, mm -hmm. at least here. Uh, because most of mine was an anti-Clinton vote. And I'm not saying that, you know, there weren't people that voted against me because they didn't like me or, you know, my policies. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it was mainly a vote against Clinton because he wasn't on the ballot and I was the only one there that they could vote against. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that uh, the party switchers like Sonny Perdue and Nathan Deal and Mike Bowers has brought Democrats into the Republican Party? Sure, it, it's brought Democrats into the party. Um, you know, and all of those guys have been my friend, and I consider, still consider them to be friends of mine. Um, Mike Bowers comes here to the law school a lot, and I see him and speak to him, and we you know, have a good cordial relationship. Uh, Nathan was very close to me, um, you know, throughout my political career. Um, and Sonny was a, a good friend of mine in the, in the state senate. And when I've seen him, you know, since then, and when he was governor, we've had a very cordial relationship. Um, I think Sonny was probably more conservative, um, you know, being just a, a rural legislator, more conservative than the other two were. Uh, Nathan, I think, grew into a conservative <laughs> uh, because when I knew him and we worked together so closely, he was a moderate Democrat. Uh, Bowers, the same thing. Now, Bowers was uh, moderate, and I think he saw an opportunity, um, you know, when he thought it was thinking about running for governor, that, um, you know, he had a better shot as a Republican than mm -hmm. as a Democrat. But, you know, I, I, that's not to question their uh, credibility, because I think that they, you know, if they switch parties, they, they you know, could have a valid reason for it, other than just to get elected. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I don't think it's fair to say that the party left me. That's what you hear a lot of people who switch parties say. Mm -hmm. I didn't leave the party, it left me. Well, you know, the party, you know, this is, we're talking about the party of George McGovern in 1972, long before uh, Nathan got involved in, in politics and long before Bowers got involved in politics. And, and, of course, that was maybe the national party. And it was a little bit off the deep end with McGovern. There's no question about that. It wasn't a moderate party. Uh, it, it, but in Georgia, um, you know, it, it, we still had a lot of progressive people, and I would include both Bowers and Nathan as being a progressive uh, it, when I worked with them in the s state senate. Uh, and Na Nathan just gradually shifted off uh, to the right. If you're a candidate today, would you still be a Democrat? No question about it. I'm a Democrat through and through. 
uh, you know, I couldn't be a candidate, you know, here anymore. But um, because I think the electorate has changed uh, a lot, mm -hmm. um, and the Democrat and the Republicans have done a lot of lot better in the rhetoric war than we have, certainly in the South. Um, mm -hmm. But it's um, I would I, I, I could I, I could never run as a Republican. I'm sure you've noticed that today's Republican leaders were once leaders of the Democratic Party. Uh, Sonny Perdue, who's governor, Nathan Deal, who will, who has been elected yep. governor, mm -hmm. and and Mike Bowers. Right. So does that speak well of the leadership, past leadership of the Republican Party? You mean the leaders before them? To have to have former Democrats fill those positions? Well, you got to look back at the, uh, at the, who the leaders were. And one of them was Johnny Isaacson. Mm -hmm. Johnny's a good friend of mine and, and uh, I think does a, a good job. In, in Washington, I mean, in the same way with Coverdale. Coverdale was a strong leader in the, in, you know, back in the days when, as Johnny says before, it was cool to be a Republican. <laughs> um, and when, but when both of them went to Washington, they they um, had to become more partisan. I mean, Coverdale was a lot more partisan in um, in Washington than he was down here. And same with uh, with Johnny. Um, but but those two, you know, were leaders. Paul, up until the time he died, was a you know definitely a leader. He was a, you know he was a um, senior person in the Senate and only been there for a little over one term. Uh, and Johnny is, uh, I think, a very capable guy, and has always been a Republican. And uh, and some of the old Republicans, um, you know, have have passed away, or moved on. Let's say M maybe not died, but they uh, but not in, in office anymore. So um, I think that it, it shows that. Um, you know, there's some experience level that that Purdue got when he was president pro tem as a Democrat of the Senate, uh, and of course Nathan when he was president pro tem and also serving in Congress. All you know, all those years in the state state Senate, you know, he learned a lot, um, whether he was a Democrat or Republican. But um, but I think their success has been. Um, attributed to the fact that the electorate has changed uh, quite a bit. What could the Democratic Party do to regain its former status? Well, I think that um, if we could, um, you know, ad adopt a more moderate <laughs> platform um, at the state level, um, or I mean, sorry, at the national level, a more moderate platform, it might attract more people. You know, this is, a, this is really a centrist country we live in. Georgia is, um, I'd say, slightly right of center, but it's not, you know, off the deep end for the most part. And um, I think that if we could project ourselves as a little bit in a more moderate way, um, you know, we might be able to attract some people back. You know, I think Obama did a, a good job. I mean, he got 48% of the vote in, in Georgia, and that includes a lot of white votes. You know, mm -hmm. the, the um, people think his success is all attributable to the black turnout, but it, it wasn't entirely. Um, and, um, you know, Saxby almost lost um, against... Um, Jim Martin. Jim Martin, thank you. You, you, your brain is a lot better than mine <laughs> hanging on. Jim was, was a good friend of mine for years, and still is, but um, but it slipped my mind. But, you know, so Martin, you know, forced uh, Saxby into a, a runoff along with, I guess, the liber Libertarian, but, um, you know, so it's sti it still could be close. That hadn't been that long ago. It was only two years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't think all is lost. Uh, with Democrats in Georgia. Let's talk about trade. Yeah. You were appointed uh, by President Clinton uh, as the chief textile negotiator. Mm -hmm. uh, explain that to us. Well, um, 
the chief textile negotiator is in charge of negotiating all trade agreements and all trade issues relating to the textile industry. Now that include cotton because that falls under agriculture, but uh, but it's all um, you know all fabric and yarn and everything. Um, and when I was appointed to that job, uh, the textile industry was the largest employer in the manufacturing sector in the United States. Uh, you know, we think we've lost a lot of jobs, and we have, but, uh, but still in, in the late 90s, it was still the largest employer in the manufacturing sector. So, um, you know, it's also been traditionally the most protected um, industry uh, in the country. I mean, agriculture is highly protected, um, or at least subsidized. And um, but but the textile industry protection goes back to the 1930s when Japan started uh, shipping apparel over here, and they went into these uh, voluntary restraint agreements with uh, with Japan. <clears throat> but the the textile manufacturing association started at the turn of the the, the 20th century in early 1900s, maybe maybe before that, uh, but not much more. And um, so it's always been a concern um, of you know keeping our industry uh, here. Now, w w one of the big votes I had was on NAFTA uh, when NAFTA came in. Well, the textile industry, which is uh, not the apparel. Uh, cut and sew jobs versus the fabric manufacturers. The fabric manufacturers wanted NAFTA because they were tr having to compete with um, Asia and, um, you know, in, pa in South Asia, Pakistan, you know, China wasn't as big at that point in the early 90s, but it, it later became big. But all of the, the Asian fabrics, um, and they wanted to, to be able to. Um, get lower cost labor to sew, you know, to sew the pieces together. So that was what the reason they supported NAFTA. And um, of course now everybody blames NAFTA for all these things, which I don't think are, is true. Uh, NAFTA has been good for, for jobs in Georgia and also in the nation. Um, but you know, not every indus industry benefited from it. Some of them were hurt by it. That's no, there's no question about that. But that was the kind of thing that I, I was involved in. I, I voted for NAFTA when I was in Congress, and I got some criticism about it. It wasn't as big an issue in my district as some of these others were, but, uh, but it was certainly a, a major issue. Um, and um, so what I did as the chief textile negotiator was uh, to ne negotiate trade agreements uh, with other countries on textiles. Uh, for example, I was on the, the team that negotiated China's entry into the WTO, um, and, and basically they had already uh, f phased out, or most of the quotas on textiles were being phased out and ended after 2004, uh, and that was already in place. But, um, but that essentially is what the t textile negotiator does is to negotiate trade agreements and you lead the negotiations on, on, um, in that sector. Mm -hmm. How about uh, some of the specifics? Uh, the U.S.-Cambodian textile agreement. Well, that was a, a <clears throat> sort of a landmark agreement that I was involved in and uh, negotiated with Cambodia because it was the first agreement uh, first trade agreement that had um, labor uh, provisions in it that you know that that uh, was used as a benefit you know it, it, I'm, I'm uh, stumbling with this but basically what it had in our trade agreement our textile agreement with Cambodia was that if they complied with their own labor code which we had helped draft it was a very good labor code and if they complied with that labor code and didn't have child labor, didn't have forced labor, uh, didn't have you know, any violations of, of labor, then they would get more increased access to our market. That was what the agreement was all about. And it was really um, a, a landmark agreement because uh, it was the first time that had, had trade benefits that were tied to uh, labor provisions. Well, you're now associated with the Dean Rusk Center at your alma mater. 
Tell us about the center and tell us about your duties. Well, the center, for, center is a wonderful place. Uh, it was started in 1977 when Rusk was still here. Of course, he was the Secretary of State under President Kennedy and President Johnson and came here in 1971, maybe 70, and, uh, and taught here for nearly a quarter of a century. Um, he also helped bring in uh, big name professors in international law. He brought in Louis Sohn from, uh, from Harvard, and uh, he was instrumental in, in really putting the University of Georgia on the map, um, the law school on the map, uh, for in, for inter study of international and comparative law, and so we they named the center after him. It was actually created when George Busby was governor, and um, Busby put a line item in, in the budget for the Rust Center, which is kind of unusual to have a separate line item for some you know um, entity that's within the university system. Um, but it's always been used to, to aid the governor of Georgia and the state of Georgia on international trade issues uh, and other issues. Uh, I've been involved with helping um, uh, Georgia set up their office in China. Uh, it had been advisor to the Department of Economic Development and, and Sonny Purdue when they opened an office in China. And then also I've given advice to the, at the federal level. We had a, when George Bush was president, George, uh, W. Bush was president. Uh, we I supported the tr trade agreements that he um, he entered into, trying to get them passed before the Congress, and um, I'll, you know have given advice on ver various trade agreements to the federal government. But mainly, what we do is, in addition to the, that kind of outreach advice, is we have educational programs a at the law school. Um, for example, we have the, the LLM program, the, the Masters of Law, which where we train um, foreign lawyers in uh, what, what American law is all about. Some of them then can go take the New York bar after they, um, they you know, been to our LLM program. Um, and we have study abroad programs. We have a program in China that I started six years ago uh, where the students study at uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing and Fudan University in Shanghai for two weeks each. And these are really great universities, they're top universities in China. And then we have a program in Brussels that's been going uh, under Professor Gabriel Wilner, who unfortunately died last uh, summer. He uh, had been taking students there for 37 years um, studying European Union law. And we are um, reorganizing and reviving that program. We're going to add Geneva, Switzerland to the, the program. So we go to Brussels for three weeks, study EU law, and then go to Geneva for a week and study uh, international trade at the WTO law. Mm -hmm. um, then we have global internships uh, where we have more than 30 students are sent literally all over the world to internships um, that we find for them, um, you know, law firms, corporations, NGOs, um, you know, even governments uh, and clerkships um, for uh, students literally in all continents around the world. And um, we provide students through a fund that we have to, uh, f to help cover some of their expenses in getting there. Mm -hmm. And then we have conferences, um, international conferences. We had a conference um, a couple of weeks ago on uh, nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, we're having one in January on international intellectual property, and then one in February on the future of international trade. Um, and then we bring in professors uh, for, to teach short courses from, from around the world, uh, courses that aren't otherwise offered here, and then um, you know people to give lectures uh, on international issues. For example, we brought in uh, Lee Hamilton um, a couple of years ago it to speak on um, you know the various issues he's he's been involved in you know having to do with 9/11 and 9/11 uh, commission and um, we had the, our best conference that we've had was uh, bringing in five former secretaries of state um, Henry Kissinger uh, James Baker uh, Madeleine Albright. Um, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank again. 
But we have five former secretaries of state, and, and uh, oh, Colin Powell, and um, and the other Clinton secretary. I can't believe I'm I'm having this senior moment here, but um, and it, it, it was entitled uh, "Bipartisan Advice to the Next Administration" because this was in 2008 before we uh, elected a president, um, and before Hillary and um, and uh, Obama were still battling it out in the primaries. And uh, it was really a fantastic program, and it was broadcast on PBS, and um, we have it. Um, we need to give a copy to the Russell Library. I'm sure they have one here somewhere. But um, it was really a great thing that had actually been started back when Rusk was still here. He started these uh, former Secretary of State conferences. Mm -hmm. But those are the kinds of things that we do. Uh, we have a, a judicial, international judicial training program that we run here. In fact, right now, as we speak, we've got 80 judges from, um, from Brazil who are here, and we're uh, giving them training in, in um, judicial administration. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of things that we do. Very interesting. Let's talk for a minute, a minute about the Don Johnson family. You have a son, I know, who seems to be following in your footsteps. Yeah. Well, I've got two sons and a daughter. Uh, my, my oldest son is Cleet Johnson. Uh, he's named after my father. And he is on the Senate Intelligence Committee staff right now. Uh, he's been there for about two years. Uh, before that, he worked for Senator Jay Rockefeller from West Virginia, and he was his counsel for international um, trade and national security issues. And before that, he um, was at Patton Boggs Law Firm uh, as a young associate. But he's a graduate of the University of Georgia Law School. Uh, he went to the London School of Economics with a Fulbright um, scholarship uh, before that. And he um, gr graduated from Harvard in 1996, where he was uh, on the varsity football team. He was a starter for, for three years. Uh, or he was a letterman for three years, but he started the last two as a free safety. And um, then I have a, um, a daughter who is a graduate of the University of Georgia, uh, married uh, to Matthew Barnett uh, from Atlanta, and they live in Chattanooga. And they gave us a grandchild last uh, summer. Not, not this summer, but the summer before last. She's 16 months old. And then my youngest son is Alex. Um, he just graduated from the University of Georgia in uh, 2009. And he worked for Jim Marshall, Congressman Jim Marshall, for, um, for a little over a year. Um, and then in uh, the summer, last summer, he joined the staff of the uh, Homeland Security Committee, um, where he worked for uh, the subcommittee chairman, uh, Mary Landrieu from Louisiana. His, his subcommittee deals with um, disaster issues, such as uh, Katrina hurricane and, um, and the oil spill. So that's what my three children are, are doing at this point. As you look back over your career as a public servant, what would you consider your greatest accomplishment? <clears throat> well, um, you know, I, I, I don't, can't point to any one particular thing. I, I feel like I've made a, a difference in several different areas. When I was in the state senate, um, I felt like I made a difference on that you know, little telephone issue. It was. Uh, it didn't seem so small at the time, but you know, looking back on it, I, that's one of the few things that I still have people come up to me and say, "We really appreciate you doing that," and that was, uh, you know, 22 years ago. Um, but then the budget reform and and changing the way the Senate um, does a budget, I think, was you know, it's maybe inside baseball to some people, but it, it, it to me it was a it was a major accomplishment. Um, and then there was a number of other issues that I worked on, um, and I, I was the lead author of, but I worked on with Mike Bowers, I worked on with Zell and, and, uh, and others um, that, you know, the State Hobbs Act I mentioned, uh, uh, there's a sovereign immunity bill that, um, you know, I was involved in with, for, uh, for, with Mike Bowers. And, um, and then, um, you know, it, it, it was really, I really felt like, I, I, I used to, 
uh, tell people, you know, what it's like to, to be in public office. Um, the way I would describe it is that if you, if, first of all, if you get into to politics for the money, you're either a fool or a crook. <laughs> uh, and, there's, and it's getting harder and harder to be a crook. So you, you gotta be a fool most, <laughs> mostly. Uh, but what I got into it for was uh, what I call the bush hog theory. And you probably have ridden a bush hog a few times. But when I'm on my farm, I, I used to like to get on my bush hog and drive it around and go through these high weeds. You know, I, I didn't grow uh, any crops on my property. I just grew a lot of weeds <laughs> and bushes. And the only way I had to harvest them was with the bush hog. But, uh, but you could tell where you've been. When you look behind you, you know where you've been. And that's the, that's the real gratification that you get from being in, in public service. Uh, is if you can do something like that where you've made some difference. Now, I'm not going to say that I was responsible for um, the budget bill passing in 93, even though it passed by one vote. There was 218 of us that voted for it. And, um, but I think it made a difference. Um, so the time that I spent in Congress, um, I have to say that, that those difficult votes were really important to me and to they're to important to my heritage and my my family, um, and the the deficit you know was reduced I think you, it's safe to say because of that that bill and uh, a lot of us lost uh, because of it. You know, uh, one time I went back bef before I got appointed to, to get back in the um, in government when, when uh, Clinton appointed me ambassador. Um, I, went, I happened to be in Washington and decided to go to see the State of the Union address because I still had privilege of going on the House floor. And um, I went in there in, um, I think it was 98. Yeah, it was 98. And um, by that time, the, the deficit had started to come down and it looked like it was a projection for surplus which it did, and, um, and Clinton in his State of the Union address uh, sort of chided the Republicans. He said, you know, some of you guys were saying that the world was gonna come to an end if this passed, and, um, and there's some people who, um, you know, gave up on the Democratic side who gave up their jobs for, uh, for this measure and all of a sudden, the, uh, the crowd of Democrats, you know, as they you know, traditionally do, get up and start clapping and yelling and everything, but it was more than just normal. And, um, and I happened to be in that, in that room, and um, after it was over, I was standing out in the hall behind the chamber, and, and Clinton happened to walk out there. And he came up to me and he said, Don, they were really clapping for you in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, it made me feel good, and really, I, you know, I, I hated to lose when I did. I'm not going to uh, lie about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily want to be in, uh, you know, a career politician. I, I wanted to stay in there for about three terms and then run for the Senate and see how that went. <laughs> I didn't get that opportunity. But, um, but those, those are the moments that, uh, that I think are important, and uh, at least in my little political career. I was in politics uh, elective politics for eight years, and then um, in the at, uh, in the White House office for um, another two and a half years. So I had about ten and a half years of public service in addition to my um, Air Force time, and I feel pretty good about that. It was a great experience. Um, I wouldn't take anything for it. I, I'm not sure I'd pay anything to go back. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but it, it was certainly a, a great experience, and I had a lot of good friends that I spent some uh, quality time with and still see them from time to time. Well, you've had certainly had a very interesting career, and we thank you for being our guest today and invite you back anytime you want to come. Okay. Happy to be there. I don't know if i got anything else to say, but I'll <laughs> be happy to come back. Thank you, Bob. <laughs>